Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here for class this morning. What I want us to do is take a walk back through time. Let's get back to 2 Kings chapter 5. One of those fantastic Old Testament stories that just by itself, it, it just never gets old. These Old Testament stories are so wonderful, so much action. But it's so much deeper than that. And what I, what I do this morning is try and get into that deeper line of thought and look at the characters that gather around the river in 2 Kings chapter 5 to deal with Naaman and his leprosy. <clears throat> Be a lesson kind of about introspection. And we're going to look at each character, make some points about each character. But I'm going to ask you here at the start and then I'm going to ask you again at the end. If you had been in the shoes of any one of these characters, what would you have done? Would you have done anything different? Could you have done anything better? Or would you have come up short <clears throat> of what these characters managed to do? Just in case there's someone who doesn't know the story, we will read it section at a time. But the sections are going to be separated as we get to these uh, characters. <clears throat> I'm going to ask uh, Keith, if you don't mind, lead us in an opening word of prayer. And then we'll begin our class. Again, thank you all for being here this morning. 2 Kings chapter 5. Let us pray, please. Our God, we come unto you in humbleness of prayer, recognizing that we are blessed beyond measure to have this opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. Our God, we are thankful for Gilbert, his willingness to stand before us to preach your word. We pray that you always watch over him, give him strength, Give him courage to never stray from the truth. Our God, we are thankful for those that are here today studying your word. Continue to watch over us. We pray, God, that there are several missing this hour. That whatever the hindrance might be, it can be removed. And they can come back and be with you. Our God, we are most thankful for Jesus, our Savior. We recognize his life upon this earth was sinless. He died a terrible crucifixion for us all. And as we walk through this day and through our lives, may we never forget this. Please forgive us of our sins, and through Jesus we do pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> as you go through the different uh, kings of the Old Testament, there's certainly several people that come into play. But more specifically for this morning... There are several nations that come into play throughout that Old Testament. <clears throat> the Philistines, the Amorites, the Moabites, all these different people that come around. And what we're going to find this morning is we're going to deal with uh, Syria, one of the kingdoms that uh, rose to power and then was subdued. Hey, will you do me a favor? Someone else walks in, get you some exercise. Thank you, sir. And as these different kingdoms would come into play, they're referenced throughout the Old Testament. And what's going to happen here in 2 Kings 5 is that it's the time when Syria is going to be the world power. And uh, one of the reasons they are the world power at the time is because they have the superstar. And as we go through uh, 2 Kings 5 here, I need you to be thinking in those terms to throw that word in there. Naaman is a superstar on the world stage. He does a phenomenal job for Syria. He's, a, he's, he's simply a better general than what the other kings had. So Syria wins a lot of battles and they become very powerful. But Superstar is going to have a problem. And so we're going to start off here in 2 Kings 5. We'll begin with verse 1. We'll read the first three as we look at the first section. I want you to look at the paper and see uh, that it's the same format most of the way down till we get to the end and i did the first one for you we're going to look at this little servant girl <clears throat> and see what action she did and then see if we can find a new testament principle to match and on your sheet i want you to see on that new testament principle that i put those powerful three letters etc because it's not a try and match gilbert's morning there's probably countless applications that we can make from each one of these characters over into the new testament but just in case everybody goes quiet on me which is not like y'all that's all right. I've got one written down, so there's not going to be that awkward silence. But we'd love to get your input because <clears throat> that's one of the big differences between a class situation versus the sermon. Because in the class, I'm expecting 
and hopeful that you will participate and give me some of those tie-ins. That's where the learning occurs. And as is the case in almost every Bible class, things that the audience comes up with are, are better than what the presenter has come up with because two minds are better than one. And that's what we want this morning is everyone using their Bible knowledge. Second Kings chapter 5, let's get into this fascinating story. Verse 1, now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable. Because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria, he was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. The Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. So the action I put on there is that here's this little girl. We don't know her age, but she's described as little in the King James. And she realizes that this man that was her master, Naaman, needed saving because leprosy was a terminal disease. And she took it upon herself to say something. She knew how he could be saved. So as insignificant as she was in this uh, honorable palace with this worthy man that was on a player on the world stage, she spoke up. She did something. So the New Testament principle I wanted to point out about that is Matthew 28, 18 and 19. For reasons that I cannot explain because I'm not God, you and I, as insignificant as we are on the world stage, are the ones that are given a job to tell others about salvation, just like this little girl. Matthew 28. 19, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Wow, what a load. Congratulations. If you didn't realize the responsibility you had this morning, you do now just from that first verse. Eight billion people in the world is the current estimate I've seen. And you and I are the ones that are supposed to be talking, telling others about salvation. Just like this little girl. Can I just say it as we're looking at this little girl? I have never been a slave. Even as an adult, it's hard for me to put myself in her shoes, which is what I was saying. I'm asking you to do this morning. I have no idea what that is like. And then let's compound the fact. Not only is she a slave, she's little, tiny little thing. Has obviously some memory about her home place. So knows that she's not home. Knows that something has been done. And where is it? Verse uh, 2. Had brought away captive out of the land of Israel. She had been taken by force. So she knows about the home place. Knows the history there. She's old enough to know what's going on. I, I can't imagine. In my family tree. And some of you have some of the same situation. I had a great grandmother. That was carried away by Indians. And then later was rescued and she had to try and readjust and, and get back to a different civilization. So same, same little thing has happened all over the world down through time. But for me to make a connection with that, that's especially hard for me. I've never been a slave. And so where I'm going with this, well, I was on each character, could you do better? Could you do worse? I can't look you in the eye and say that if someone had come into my country, carried me away as a child from people that I remember, that I would want to help them. Even if I knew the answer. So wow. Kudos to this little girl. What a lesson for you and I. She could have remained quiet. Which would have been legitimate. If she was scared to death. She could have remained quiet. You know just out of revenge. <laughs> I know how this guy could be cured. But he, he and his people carried me away captive. I'm not going to say anything. But she doesn't. She doesn't do any of those things. So God's plan is that we talk. Now, what's interesting, excuse me, another interesting thing about this, verse 4, and one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is at the land of Israel, who in their right mind is going to go into the king and repeat what a little servant kid said? Hmm. When Daniel is carried away, he and the three cohorts with him, scholars think they're a little bit older and they're making, they certainly do the right thing when they're carried away captive. Pure, because he's the he's the superhero here for their nation. That maybe out of desperation they're listening for any whispering of anything. Could could be that simple. But someone listen to this kid. Yes, sir. It strikes me about her the words not here, but compassion. On New Testament principle, we're to have compassion <clears throat> for the lost. You noted 
she's been carried off, she's out of away from homeland and familiar or anything, and yet rather than I wish this guy would die, who's hauled me away or whatever, she wants the better thing for him to be healed and good things to happen to. Him. So, so another Yeah. I mean it just goes on and on. We, you want to talk all class about these three verses or no, no, I don't want to talk the whole class about these three have verses. She good news to share, and she has faith that if he will go do this, he can be healed. Faith, and how does the child get faith? Has she seen it happen before? Did she just know the stories from her parents? There's so many ways a person can get faith, and she kept it with her as she crossed the border into that foreign country as a slave. So there's another New Testament principle you can write down. Compassion. Her message helped one, helped one. And you and I, under that uh, premise of Matthew 28, 19 and 20, we might just help one person. And that's all right. You know, it's not up, up to um, God needing you and I. God didn't need this little girl. He could have cured Naaman some other way if he'd wanted. If God wanted everyone in the world to be saved, he could wash away everyone's sin. But God is God and you and I are not. And he makes it plain what the plan is you and I are supposed to talk. So there's two New Testament principles for you. Compassion as well as uh, we're supposed to talk. And what else do you have? Doug? Yeah, how dare you jump ahead? Shame on you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's an excellent point. For back up in time, and the Israelites get into the promised land, circle Jericho, they send in spies, and Rahab says, the people are already scared because we know what y'all's God did when you crossed the Red Sea. Well, that was 40 years before in a land far away. And yeah, that hearsay is very powerful. The, the Israelites did have that reputation. Fantastic. Sir. Kind of circle back around the, the, the notion of having good news to share for her, same as for us, is, is a realization of our limitations. That I'm not the one, I don't have the power to cleanse of leprosy, to forgive sin, to whatever, but I know who does. And I can get you connected to that power. Specifically, she even names the prophet. So, very good. Nothing about her. She knows not only the place he needs to go, but the person that he needs to go to. Excellent point. All right, just for the sake of time, I need to keep moving. Let's read 4 through 6. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have uh, therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Wow. So the action, what I put is, 
He's repeating to, and again, is it, is it desperation? Uh, obviously, he doesn't know about the prophet there, or he might have already sent Naaman, but he is listening to what needs to happen. Whether it's desperation or whether it was relief, oh, finally, I can, it could have even been political. I can get this ball out of my court and hand it off to someone else, okay? There's several things that could have caused him to listen, but he hears what's going on. And, of course, Romans 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So that's the obvious one that I wrote down, but it doesn't have to just be that one. Let me talk about this king for a little bit and see what else you come up with for a New Testament application. It's no problem believing that there is a prophet for this king, as Doug just pointed out. That tends to be uh, things that people know about the nation of Israel because it's so incredible. When we get down to section 4, I'm going to roll quickly through the things that Elisha had already done in the first four chapters. Oh my word, the whole world should know about Elisha from the series of miracles that he's already pulled off in the short time he's been a prophet. So that's not any big deal. It's, it's no wonder the little girl knows about Elisha, as we'll see in a minute. But Israel, even though this king has no problem believing, Israel wouldn't hear their own prophets. As we just went through that Wednesday night class about prophet after prophet after prophet. And in those prophets, one of the things that gets me so frustrated is there's not one man that ever stands up and says, that's exactly right. That's what I'm going to do with my house. Well, no matter what y'all do, we're going to listen to this prophet. You don't ever see that in the prophets. But here's this king saying, oh yeah, that's exactly what we're going to do. You have this reputation over there with these prophets. I need to send my guy over there. And he sends him. You're going to send your star soldier, your superstar, to the enemy. Really? You're going to send your superstar to the enemy because that's where this little girl was from. She had been captured from this place you're going to send your superstar to. Now, because we're in such a sports-oriented society, <laughs> this is the closest I could get to. If the Cowboys even had a superstar, just pretend like they did, and they got injured, we decide to send him to the eagles medical facility and we're going to pay the eagles to fix our superstar what could ever go wrong with that you know and here's the plan that he's trying kind of funny to me we need to open our heart and hear the bible's testimony what the bible is telling us each of these verses has to mean something to us personally yes sir Right. In verse 1, uh, I think the king probably recognized them. By him, by Naaman, the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. I think it's pretty obvious to the king and probably everyone else, uh, there's just something really special going on with him. Hey, suddenly he has terminal illness. So I, it, it doesn't say desperation, but I certainly feel like that's a legitimate possibility of what's going on here. Any other New Testament principles about um, listening, hearing? All right. Moving on, King of Israel, verse 7, in sharp contrast. <laughs> it's, oh, it's not funny like it makes you laugh, but it's, it's funny in that it's, it's so ironic that these two guys are put right next to each other. We leave verse 6 with one king and go right into verse 7. And it came to pass when the King of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. So what action just immediately do you see there from this guy in his one verse of print? Who's he thinking of? Himself. <laughs> just thinks of himself. Wow. Isn't that something? Um, so... He's in, he's in a delicate political situation. Okay, I'll, I'll give you that. But why is it that Elisha has to come in in verse 8 that we'll read in, in a second and say, why, why are you rending your clothes? You know, I, I got this. He, he's not here to see you. Okay, we're going to see that in verse 8 in a second. Send him on down, like they would say on the prices, right? I have read this story uh, 
all my life, had Bible class teachers go through it, and somehow had missed this line in verse 7 until, until getting ready for this class. Am I God to kill, are you ready, and to make alive? And to make alive. The Old Testament people, they knew. They knew how they got here. There wasn't all the stuff that we have to put up with in our print and our social media about the fluky theories that people come up with. They knew who made people alive. And hold that thought. Again, when we get to Elisha here in section four, I'm going to roll back through what he had already done as a prophet. Hint, hint. I bet you can figure out what one of the things is that Elisha had done in the first four chapters in this king's lifetime and he knows that god is the one who does this back to what doug said it's a terminal disease this guy's dead except with god god can make him alive what a powerful phrase so even though he seems to not have his best day here in verse 7 and he's all wrapped up in himself he does realize who god is and what power god has I'd never caught that before. Thinks of himself. Well, this one, I'm going to steer you a certain direction, please. I'm just going to pull rank and go first, but then I do want to hear your New Testament connection. Look with me at Acts chapter 8, please. Someone else who is very selfish and thought of himself. But as we're sitting here going along, just bam, 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 character, character, character. I want to stop here for just a second and turn our drill bit down. I want to go a little bit deeper in this point right here and then to fit the clock we'll have to keep going on a pretty rapid pace on the others but let's let's just pause a second here on acts chapter eight someone else who thought of himself in acts chapter eight we have this character in verse 13 named simon okay who believed and was baptized and continued with philip wondered beholding the miracles and signs which were done but in verse 18, where I'm asking you to focus, his old habits get a hold of it. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Okay. For someone who is a new believer... Sometimes we need to cut them a little slack. We, we expect them maybe to be a little bit behind in the details because, can, can we just say it again? The Bible is a big book, a lot of rules, a lot of history in the Old Testament, a lot of deep principles in the New Testament. It takes a while to get all this together. And, and Simon hasn't been a Christian for very long. But Peter jumps on him pretty hard. And in his jumping on him pretty hard for being so, I think he's jumping on him pretty hard because he's being selfish. He says, I want to do this too. Okay, From his past, he had been this magician, this hoodlum that hoodwinked people into forking over their dough so he could have financial gain. In jumping on him pretty hard, Peter throws down this principle that I want to talk about for just a minute because it is so important to you and I. Do you realize in the in the safety of this room as we are gathered together, do you realize that if you are baptized for the remission of your sins and you have done each of the steps that the Bible says you need to do to be saved, that you have joined a club and you get a card and you get to do something with your card that the rest of the world does not get to do and it's something that you and i have just like using your sam's card or whatever card where you get the benefits your triple a card because i keep getting those emails all the time want me to join triple a thank you very much you get that card you get these benefits okay it's not a literal card let me say it's a i'm talking about the principle of a thing and what is it that we learn about from these two verses right here that you and i get to do that the rest of the world does not get to do. I want to hear somebody say it right out loud. Louder. Pray. Okay, pray for forgiveness. 
forgiveness. You have messed up. We don't have to come back up in the church building and be baptized all over again. Here's these two little verses showing, oh, you pray for forgiveness because you have departed from the way. All right? Now that concept is gargantuan. But the Holy Spirit, being the Holy Spirit, gives it two little verses right here for you and I to pick up on. That's why I want to stop and drill deep on this for a second. Because I'm going to tell you something about me. And I happen to know that I'm not unique. Because it's just like her. And it's just like him. And it's just like him. And it's just like her. Every one of you have this same thing in common with me. I just happen to be the one saying it out loud. I feel in my physical limitations. Like God sits on his throne and says. Holy cow. Is Gilbert asking for forgiveness of that sin again? For the 18th time today, he is asking me to forgive him again. Because that's what we as humans tend to think about a situation. That, that's all our brain will do is think about physical situations. And we try, we try and step out there into the spiritual realm. But here's where I'm drilling deep to say we've got we to stop and say, Hey, <laughs> God's not limited by the physical mind and a physical existence and what he sees on this earth with all the relationships here whereas someone here would definitely grow weary of me having to ask them over and over hey please forgive me of that but god's not physical doesn't have those limitations and we have this club we get to belong to this it's usually a negative word are you ready here it's positive we get to be in this click where we get to ask god for forgiveness through prayer and the rest of the world does not get that privilege you know there's other things that you get look with me at ephesians chapter 3 hold your hand there in second kings 5 we're coming right back ephesians 3 in verse 6 that the gentiles oh that'd be you and i we're not jews you thought about that that the gentiles that's gilbert and the saints here at the wichita falls church of christ should be fellow heirs and of the same body fellow heirs god being spiritual has the capacity to look at me and think of me as his child the same way that he thinks, as described in the Bible, describes Jesus as his son. Whew. Well, I don't deserve that. And I happen to know you don't deserve that. And none of us deserve that. That's a gift. By doing these steps of salvation that the teachers are teaching the little kids down the hall, you get into this you get a privilege that the Bible calls a gift from God. And that may be the most important thing that we get out of our class this morning to think for just a minute about this gift that we have. All right, that's the New Testament principle I wanted to put by the King of Israel. Anybody have a different one? If not, I'll move on to section four. All right, section four, Elisha. Verses 8 through 10. And it was so when Elisha the man of God had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes. That he sent to the king saying wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes. Let him come now to me. Verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot. And stood at the door. The house of Elisha. Now this is the man who conquers empires. Borders don't matter to him. He stands at the door. <laughs> when you're needing someone to heal you of a terminal disease. You don't march in with your army. You stand there with a little respect. Here in Texas, we'd have our cowboy hat in our hand, you know, showing some respect. But Elisha, verse 10, <laughs> sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Okay, so several actions here. You can go with verse 8, he chastises the king. Verse 10, he sends a messenger. Verse 16, he refuses the pay that is going to be offered. In verse 26 and 27, he's going to transfer the leprosy uh, from Naaman onto Gehazi. But here's where I want you to think in terms now of who is really the superhero. The world sees Naaman as the superhero because of what he's accomplished on the world stage. But if we had time to go back to the start here of 2 Kings. 2 Kings, Elijah dies, is received up into heaven. Elisha gets his mantle, walks to the river, smites it, and the river parts. That's 2.13. 2.19 through 22, he causes Jericho's water to be cured. 
Chapter 2, verse 24, he sicks two she-bears onto the kids who call him bald, and the bears rip up 42 of those kids. Chapter 3, 1 through 27, he saves the whole country from the Moabites. Chapter 4, 1 through 7, he has the widow pour oil into all the vessels that she can gather up, and the oil just keeps coming out of that jar and it fills up all this stuff so that she can go sell it and make enough money to get by. Chapter 4, 14 through 17, a woman conceives who has not been able to conceive before, even though she has a very old husband. Chapter 4, and verse 35, he raises this child from the dead in. Wow, if you don't know this story, you need to pause for me and go back and skim a few verses around chapter 4 and verse 35. What a, what a weird, wild, and wacky way to raise a child from the dead. Nothing else like it in the Bible. Chapter 4, 39 through 41, he f uh, fixes a poisoned pot of food. And chapter 4, verse 42, he feeds the masses, very much like Jesus feeds the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. He has a little bit more to work with than that. But it's not nearly enough. And the men around him say, we, we can't even set this out for just 100 people. And you're trying to feed. He said, no, nah, they'll be left over. And mirac miraculous gift there. They feed all these masses, the sons of the prophets. And there's food left over. It's a hall of fame worth of miracles just in two little chapters. And he hasn't been a prophet for that many years. But now there are some years that have gone by in these first four chapters because this little girl knows of his reputation and this baby that he causes to be conceived dies and he heals that baby who's now a little boy. So, so we know some time has gone by, but everybody knows about Elisha. So what I want to put out here, actually, first I want to hear before I give you mine, let me put you on the spot. What New Testament principle would you have about uh, Elisha? Who's done all this list of miracles that I'm telling you about. And then when this guy tries to pay him. This guy who is a world player. Has plenty of money. The king has sent him with extra money. Elisha says. Nah. What New Testament principle would you get out of any part of that? Yes sir. We've done everything we've been commanded to do. We are yet unprofitable servants. Unprofitable servants. Elisha didn't pick to be the prophet didn't fill out an application get his resume accepted you know by the committee he was he was chosen to be the servant elisha doesn't have these abilities to do these miracles because he's so good or he has the right dna god gave him these abilities to work for him to be the mouth for him unprofitable service anyone else that's a wonderful one to write down please also throw down Acts 14, 12 through 15, when Paul and Barnabas are going through the city and they work a miracle and the priest comes out and starts trying to sacrifice oxen to them and they start calling them Greek gods and Paul and Barnabas said, stop, what are you, what are you even doing? You know, this is, it's not like we can do this on our own. We're not the one. It's not about me. Well, Paul has a very accomplished list of miracles too, but his spreads out over a lot more time. Elisha in these first four chapters is another world player, another superhero. It's not about me. All right, chapter, uh, section five, Naaman, nine through 18. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Oh, sorry, I already read verse 10, no, chapter, verse 11. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said behold I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper alright so Naaman his <laughs> famous, famous last word behold I thought how many redneck plans go wrong with I think I can alright verse 12 are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel may I not wash in them and be clean so he turned and went away in a rage now talk about a typical let me just pick on the guys. What a guy mentality. What a Y chromosomia mentality here. Now, I can relate. If I'm naming standing here and Elisha tells me to, you know, go northwest up 287 here and get to the Red River and dip in it seven times, I'll be thinking, ah, you know, I, I can physically do that. But if I just kept going northwest up to Colorado, the river's up there. Whoo, clear mountain streams. I could even be doing some trout fishing while I'm up there. Oh, that'd be so much better. <laughs> so much better. And uh, I understand that kind of a guy mentality. But keep going. 13, his servants came 
near him, spake unto him, and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? We'll get to the servants here in a second, in section 6. Verse 14, Then went he down. So, 12, I'm not about to go in there. Verse 14, Then he goes down in there. Okay, Dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. He returned to the man of God, he and all his company came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, make a blessing, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And then at 17 and 18, Naaman asked him for a little bit of earth to carry back, just to make a mound, a little memorial, and he does that. He's the number one guy. He knows he's important. So that's probably what has happened to him in verse 11. He's probably seen things, uh, ceremonies like this done to people who are important. So he has an expectation of how this should go. Right? He's not a little girl. He's a world traveler seeing things. But he obeys the king on a servant girl's advice. What if I had a terminal illness? Would I be willing to try something that was foreign to what I thought should be done? Hmm. He listens to the common sense of his servants. And I pointed out that's a guy thing about these waters. Except there's probably some women who would think the same kind of thing. Why would I go in that? Put my toe in that river? Are you crazy? But hey, the servants we'll talk about in a second. As I stated before, uh, many men who've taught class here have stated, I, I don't understand, uh, I just don't understand why the religious world has such a problem with baptism. That's the point his servants are going to make. You're, you're going you're gonna to die. And all you have to do is just get in this water seven times. You know, come on, buddy. You're, you're known around the world for your intelligence. And, and you're going to die because you don't want to stick your big toe in this water that's a little brown. You know, after consider the things you've done before that are heroic. A kid could do this. So there's so much symbolism right there about the world's resistance to, to baptism. And I don't understand why the world doesn't have the same resistance to confession. Why the world doesn't have the same resistance to believing or hearing. But for some reason that I, I just don't understand baptism cuts it off but Naaman to his credit shuts that down that guy thinking and, and does what has to be done and it is so easy he just walks in and out of the river seven times God doesn't ask him to cut his arm off okay yes sir as you said he starts off with the turn away and rage but you know, he does come to faith and to me the point about Naaman he sees the greater Throughout the story, it's been, hey, there's a prophet appeared. Elisha says, if you'll send him up, he'll know there's a prophet in Israel. But it wasn't really about the prophet. It's who the prophet represents. He's a messenger for God. It's who the prophet represents. Naaman gets to that point. It took a little while. But to see the greater, there's no God except this God of Israel. I'm going to believe it. Excellent. And... In the big picture, if we had to, well, I've got a few more minutes, but if we had to stop class right now for the bell, isn't that the lesson? If this great world player, this superstar, can do whatever he needs to do to be saved, then you or I who are not great world players can do whatever we need to do to be saved. And so can anyone else. Just listen. And it shows such humility. Afterwards, knows that God is there, verse 15, a God that we don't know if he knew about before. All right, verse uh, 6, the servants, back in verse 13, his servants came, spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing. Now, I thought about going back and doing some research about what or some of the great things Naaman had actually pulled off. But to me, that would kind of be a distraction because he's a world player. He has conquered empire after empire. And here's his servants saying, you know, this is, this is real simple stuff. So the action I wrote down would be intervention, of course. And who is someone you know about in the New Testament that has an intervention in their life? Or 
won't do something but then realizes oh my goodness what am I thinking and turns around and does what they should do oh so you all went quiet I got it no worries I went with Acts chapter 9 when Saul becomes Paul all right he's a school of Gamaliel he's got letters from Damascus that's not a world player like Naaman but he's got clout all right and he's going around he's not only putting prisoners in jail but he he murders people he kills people for following Jesus. And then his intervention, of course, is Jesus himself on the road to Damascus. A little more important intervention than the servants, but the same thing happens. These servants had some, you know, possible jeopardy. I don't know. Uh, it's not like in Esther, you know, who was worried about if the king didn't hold out his scepter, you know, you, that was the death penalty. There's, there's no mention of anything like that. But if you're talking to someone who's more important than you and they don't like what you say, look, there could be consequences. But I want you to look how their message is short, it's pointed, and it's timely. I get the idea, I, I don't know for sure, but it's like he is standing on the banks of the river. I mean, they're, they're that close is what I'm saying. We're going to lose this opportunity if we don't say something. Because he's telling him to go wash in that river, and I see the boss is about to pack up and take us back home. Now, I've got to say something now. Short, pointed, and timely. Cared enough to speak, which was just like the servant girl. Ben. It says something about Naaman that he listens to him. You know, uh, said earlier in the chapter about being honorable. And then this young girl was able to talk to his wife. You know, it, just, it says something about how he treats his inferiors. Very good. Good leadership example but yeah he's listening and he's open and then especially i'll go back to a little more serious point about this guy thing and my fellow y chromosomians that's quite a change to go from verse 12 with that attitude to hearing those servants like ben is saying and then have a whole different attitude in chapter 14 and if this guy can do it this guy who is an accomplished world conqueror well hey you and i as guys or as women can do the same thing no they remember the, the purpose why we're here the focus as in churches all around the world today there's gonna be a ton of people show up for some pomp and circumstance or play or new outfit or whatever missing the purpose of coming together to worship god as he commands every lord's day but the servants remind him why are we here gotcha for something great happened to you no to be healed of this leprosy. Be healed of the leprosy. All right, finishing up. Uh, I don't have enough time to read the last section where Gehazi does his thing. Gehazi will always be a mystery to me because in these first four chapters that I've been telling you about, Gehazi, Gehazi has been spot on every time. Obedient, did exactly what he was supposed to in the right place at the right time. And boy, does he drop the ball and throws it all away for just a little bit of money and some garments just a little bit of materialism it reminds me very much of Achan who messes everything up for the whole nation at Jericho for a couple of garments and a little bit of money it it's not even I'm not sure you and I would even think of this as something worthy but uh, he messes all this up and so I just put down there at the bottom so that we know that he's in there there's a lesson there that nobody is safe from temptation um Gehazi has been with Elisha in these first four chapters. And I'll go back to Elisha where I rolled through all those miracles. He's seen Elisha do every one of these miracles, including this really weird thing with raising this kid from the dead. But he was successful every time. Why in the world would you pick that guy? Why would you be around Elisha after seeing him do all these miracles and think that he's not going to know what you've done? All right, final comment. How did you do? What if you were each one of these characters? Would you do better than they did? Would you do worse than they did? Would you do as good as they did? Thank you for looking with me this morning at this character study. I think we had a good class and we now stand dismissed.